let's get right to it. Turn uh, to Isaiah chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 6. There's only six verses in, in this book or in this chapter, uh, this wonderful chapter in the book of Isaiah. I'm reading from the NIV today. In the NIV, it's called uh, Songs of Praise, and that's, that's what it is. This passage today is basically a praise song. And um, so what this passage is going to be telling us is that every day that you praise God for saving you, if you are saved, if you are indeed saved, every day that you praise God for saving you is the day that you fulfill God's purpose for saving you. I want to let that sink in for a second. Every day that you praise God for saving you is a day that you fulfill God's purpose for saving you, which is to say your purpose is to praise God. So the challenge, thanks, CJ. So the challenge and exhortation for all of us today is to do just that. Let's rejoice in the salvation that, that Jesus has given to us and praise his name every day. And I'm going to be sharing about what that looks like. So let's go ahead and open up this text and read this passage together. Isaiah 12, starting in verse 1. In that day, you will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me. Your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let, his, let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. And this is the word of God. Amen. So in verse 1, it begins, In that day you will say, and then it repeats that again in verse 4. It begins, in that day you will say. So what is that day that these verses are talking about? And I want to look at that day from three different perspectives. And the first, first thing is this. Is that day is the day when Jesus came. That day is the day when Jesus came. So that day that these verses is talking about, is actually referring to a day of salvation that was promised in a prophecy back in chapter 11. And let me show you what these verses said in chapter 11. Verse 1 goes, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And then verse 5, it says this, Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And then in verse 10, in chapter 11, it says, In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nation will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. So who is this root of Jesse that we hear about in Isaiah? Hello? Jesus? That's right. The standard answer in every, every Bible question. It's Jesus Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus, and he gave this prophecy some 700 years before, before Jesus was even born. So, in other words, that day is the day that Jesus came to save the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the world that God loves so, so much is you and me. Right? Seriously, where would we be without the love of 
of God in our lives. Where every single one of us would be lost. You guys know what it means to be lost, right? It means that you have no bearing, you have no direction, you have no purpose in your life. You do not know where you are. You may not even know where you're supposed to go. That was me once. That was me once. I had no bearing in my life. I had no direction in my life. I had no purpose in my life. And the thing is, I just didn't care. I absolutely did not care one iota. I was totally, totally lost. And then Jesus came into my life. And he gave me what I didn't know that I was missing. He gave me a direction. He gave me a purpose. He gave me a bearing in my life. He is that bearing. Jesus is my direction. Jesus is my purpose. He is my map in this life. And I have to confess that as a believer right now, it's hard for me to understand what I was thinking back then. What was I thinking? Why would I reject the love of God that is given so freely to me? Why would I do that? You know, I hear some people say, I'll meet you in hell. Or, I'm going to hell. Why do people say that? It's because they don't realize that whatever they experience in hell will be infinitely, infinitely worse than whatever they experience here in this life. They feel like whatever pain and struggle that they experience in this life will somehow just disappear when they die. It won't. They feel that just because that they can bear the struggle, bear the pain that they experience in this life, that they will be able to bear the pain and that struggle in hell. But guess what? They won't. We can take any single pain that we experience here in this life, just magnify it a thousandfold, and then magnify it again to infinity. That is the struggle that we will have in hell. That is the struggle we will have there. Why in the world would anyone just give up and say, I'm going to hell? As if there is no rescue from hell. As if there is no way to get away from going to hell. But there is, right? And his name is the standard answer once again. Jesus. His name is Jesus. God doesn't want anybody to perish. God wants every single person to come to Jesus and be saved. And there's no other way. No other way. Jesus said in John 4, uh, 14, 6, and 7, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then Peter said in Acts 4, 12, Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is your salvation. In fact, the Hebrew word for Jesus is Yeshua. For salvation is Yeshua. Jesus is salvation. He is the salvation of the world. That day is the day that Jesus came. That day is the day that salvation came to the world. Second thing is this. That day is the day when you believe. When you believe. So verse 2, it starts out like this. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. In that day, you will say, God is my salvation. I will trust 
and not be afraid. And that's not just an empty statement. You will say, surely. Don't call me Shirley. No, you guys never saw airplanes? Some of you did. <laughs> Let me teach you some Hebrew here. Is that okay? The word for Shirley. Hine. Say Hine. The word for salvation is Yeshua. The word for God is El. And the word for my is T. So, Hine. El, Yeshua, T. Hine, El, Yeshua, T. Hine, El, Yeshua, T. Hine, El, Yeshua, T. Hine, El, Yeshua, T. Now you know Hebrew. <laughs> there is a powerful conviction that comes from this statement that is deeply, deeply personal. There is an absolute certainty of, about the fact that it will come. And we have this certainty because we have this personal experience of the salvation of God. You will say on that day, surely, God is my salvation. I will not be afraid and I will trust in him and him alone. Hene El Yeshua T. When you have this conviction from this statement that's in your heart, what is that called? It's called faith. It's simply called faith. Do you know who builds up your faith? It's God. That is the work that God is doing in your life. Building up faith is the work that God does in every single believer. Jesus said this in John 6, 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. God is constantly at work building up our faith. And because this is the work that God is doing in our lives, I can boldly and confidently say that you will say, surely God is my salvation and I will trust. I will not be afraid. But raise your hand if this has happened to you before. Maybe you've been at a retreat. We had a wonderful time at the retreat this past weekend. I wish uh, more could have come, but it really was a, a terrific time. Um, maybe you've been at a retreat, or maybe you've been at some conference, or me even uh, at a worship service, and the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart and stirring your heart. And maybe you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you made a rededication and recommitment of your life to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But then what happens? As soon as you walk out the doors of the sanctuary, as soon as the closing song is over, or as soon as you start going down the mountain of that retreat or that conference center, your life just goes completely back to what it was before the event. Who, of you here, who here has experienced this before? Be honest. Isn't this all of us? Every single one of us has experienced this before, haven't we? It's just like that song says. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Prone to leave the God who loves us so much. But praise be to God that he loves us so much. Because even when we're trying to leave him, he will never let us go. God will never, ever let us go. And do you know what the word of God says about this? How this works? Romans 8.5 says, God demonstrates his own love to us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us, right? It's a very famous passage. Many of us know it by heart even. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. 
Are we not sinners every day of our lives? Christ died for us every single day of our lives. Every single day Christ has died for us. So each and every day we have to draw upon the forgiveness and the grace of Christ. Each and every day of our lives. And that is what it means to walk in faith. That's what it means to walk in faith. Now on the other hand, if, if you haven't learned to do that, and I'm not judging here, it's just many people haven't learned to do that. I'm still learning how to do that. If we don't learn how to do that, it's not God's grace that we feel at all, is it? What do we feel instead? We feel shame and we feel guilt. Shame and guilt. But don't worry. Don't worry about that. If you feel shame and guilt whenever you hear the word of God, that is absolutely normal. And I will even say, I will even say that that is the result of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is causing your guilt and shame, not at all. But when the Holy Spirit draws us to the truth of the word of God, we might respond in what? Guilt and shame. That's a very, very normal response. So don't worry about it too much. Because Jesus did say that for every believer... He would fill us with the Holy Spirit and convict us of sin. He will fill every believer with the Holy Spirit and convict us of sin. So if we respond in guilt and shame, that's very natural for us, isn't it? That's really, really natural. But here's the thing. If you're responding in guilt and shame, first of all, I would say that that's a sign that you are saved. Because if you're not responding in guilt and shame, that just means you don't care. How scary is that? I'm going to be running away from that kind of person. But if you do feel that in your heart, it's from the Holy Spirit. It's the conviction of sin that brings that into your heart and into your mind. But we should be concerned if we just stay there. We should be concerned if we're lingering in guilt and shame. And if we allow that guilt and shame to separate us from the love of God, but we can't. God will always come back for us. God will always come back for us. We know this, right? We know this. So it's very important to keep both things in balance. Yes, he will convict us of sin, our sin. But here's the thing. There's another part to what Jesus said. He said when the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, he will also convict us of our righteousness. In Jesus Christ, we are righteous in God's eyes, no if, ands, or buts about it. In Jesus Christ, we are righteous, 100% righteous in God's eyes. And Jesus did this for us. This is nothing that we can do for ourselves, can we? Because Jesus, the very Son of God, the very Son of God, He came, He substituted Himself to pay the penalty for our sins. He substituted himself to suffer the torture, to suffer the humiliation, to suffer the mocking, to suffer the slow suffocation to death on a cross, and not to mention the full wrath of God in hell to pay the penalty for our sins. So we're good, every single one of us. So if we have that conviction of sin, that's normal. But don't forget the conviction of righteousness. You're good. Hallelujah. You're good in God's eyes. So what, this, what does this mean for us as believers? Well, it means this. It means, therefore, there is now 
no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We are free. There is no condemnation. Is there some condemnation from Jesus Christ? There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So, when you naturally feel a little shame and guilt, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, let Jesus wipe it away! Let Him wipe it away. It's gone! And then when you feel it again, wipe it away again! And again! And again! And again! Jesus has taken care of it all. So then what? In Hebrews it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And I don't know about you, but my time in need is every single day. Every single day. So that day is the day that you believe because that day is also the day of your salvation. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Last thing is this. That day is the day when you proclaim Jesus' name. So the structure of this passage is really clear, and the meaning of it is pretty clear too, I think. I already mentioned that in verse 1 it begins, in that day you will say, and then it repeats that in verse 4, in that day you will say. And the, in verse 1, that marks the first half of the song, and the first half is personal. It's about my salvation and the experience of my salvation in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 4 it says, in that day, uh, once again. But the second half is Public, and it contains an exhortation for others to praise God. The first half says, I will praise God. And the second half says, you praise God among the people because of what he has done and who he is. And so by singing, I will praise God. And by singing, praise God yourself, not only is that in itself praise, both of these halves are testifying about the salvation of God. The salvation of God in Jesus Christ. So basically what I'm saying here is that praise itself is proclamation. Do you know that? All these songs that we sing like we do, did today, all of it is proclamation of salvation in Jesus Christ. That's sharing the gospel. Worship is witnessing about the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Let me say just a couple things about this really quick. The first it's kind of theological, so bear with me a little bit, all right? The first is theological, but we have to understand it, okay? We have to understand it. The second thing I want to say about this is more applicational. So we have to do it, okay? First part, we have to understand. Second part, we have to do. So first of all, the first half of the song is about a personal experience of salvation, and the second half is about praising God for what He has done, like it says in verse 4. And then in verse 5, it says, because he has done glorious things. And then in verse 6, it says, great is the Holy One of Israel among you. These are the things that we are praising God about. Now, our personal experience of salvation in Jesus Christ, your personal experience of salvation in Jesus Christ, is very important for building up your faith. It's critically important for building up your faith. And that is exactly what the study Experiencing God is all about. Experiencing God is to know and to do the will of God. And I didn't realize it when I was preparing uh, to do this study some, about a couple of months back. I had no idea that Pastor David was going to be preaching about this very thing on the last night. This was the exact thing that Pastor David was preaching about last, um, on the last night of the retreat. And then, when I got home, I did my uh, devotion the next day in living life. It was talking about this very thing. And it said this, As we learn to listen and obey His voice through His word, He will reveal His will regarding our lives from the big picture to the intricate details. Knowing and doing the will of God in our lives. That's what it means to experience God. 
Now, I don't believe in coincidences, especially when it comes at me in threes, right? God is trying to tell me something. And I'm pretty sure that God is trying to tell all of us something. So yeah, your personal experience of God in your salvation, your personal experience of God at work in your life is crucially important to the building of your faith. But, and the point I want to make about this is, is this, that your personal experience of salvation and your personal experience of God at work in your, in your life is not the only thing when it comes to faith. That is not where faith begins. Because fundamentally, faith is about believing the witness that has been handed down by Jesus and the apostles. In other words, believing the gospel of Jesus Christ that's contained in this book, in these words. That's where faith begins, believing the word of God. That's where faith begins, that's where faith ends. And in fact... This kind of faith, faith that comes from believing the gospel, is stronger than faith that comes from your personal experience of God. It really is. Do you know why? Because Jesus said so. <laughs> it's not because I said so. It's because Jesus said so. He said in John 6, 29, Because you have seen me, he's talking to the apostles, the very same apostles, because you have seen me, you have believed but then he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Basically, what Jesus is saying, of course you should believe in me. You've seen me. You've lived with me for three years. You've seen all the signs and wonders that I've been doing. You've seen all the miracles. You've seen my power. You better believe or else you're just stupid. But those people who have not seen all this stuff, and yet just believe this testimony? Wow. That's real faith. That is true faith. That is real faith. The second thing that this song talks about, as I mentioned, is that praise is proclamation. Worship is witness. We know that praise and worship, it is vertical. vertical. There's a vertical dimension to it. It's exalting God. And we know that praise and worship, there's a horizontal dimension to it as well, right? We're edifying one another when we sing. I don't know, when, we, when, when you hear the voices, when you hear the voices singing around you, that just lifts up your spirit, doesn't it not? I mean, you should have heard us in the, in the retreat. We were like in this bubble, and when we were praising, the band was loud, but the voices were louder. It was so cool. You cannot imagine how that just lifts up your spirit, hearing the praises of God from God's people. It's just, just wonderful. So there is this vertical dimension. There's this horizontal dimension to it as well. But there's also this outward-facing dimension to praise and worship. There's an outward-facing dimension, which basically means that praise and worship serves the function of evangelism. Do you get that? Praise and worship serves the function of evangelism. Has that been your experience? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But here's one thing I will say about that. If praise and worship is going to be evangelism, it better be good. It better be good. It better be excellent as a matter of fact. And you might be thinking, Oh, what the heck does this have to do with me? Aren't you the pastor of this church, of this community? Isn't it your job to make sure that the worship is excellent here? You and the worship team and the worship leaders? Isn't it your job to make the worship excellent here? Yes. I take full, full ownership of that. But I will say... And I propose that every single one of us here are responsible for excellent worship here in this room. Every single one of us. And so I want to close with just three applications real quick um, about how to make our worship here excellent. Now, 
the worship team here. Stephen Jeepsanen was here the day I stepped foot into the sanctuary. And it's so, uh, it's like one of those bittersweet moments, you know. But I, I believe we're still in the same community. And I believe that God will arrange an opportunity for us to minister together again one of these days. And that's my prayer, okay? That's my prayer. <laughs> but he's been here from the very beginning, working so hard to bring excellent worship into this community. Paul and the rest of the worship team, Anna, James, every single one, every single person that's up here have been working so hard to make this an excellent worship community. I think you can see it, right? I hope you can see it. And if you don't see it, I'm telling you right now, they're working really hard to bring excellent worship into this community and they're improving each and every week. But not just the worship team up here, the welcoming team. They're doing everything that they can to bring excellent worship to this congregation. I'll be sitting in the back, Derek back there, everybody that's a part of bringing this worship together, ministering to the Lord, we are trying very hard to bring excellent worship into this community. So here's the thing. We do this so that hopefully that you will never ever be embarrassed to invite a friend to come and worship with us. That's not the only goal, obviously, right? We have this vertical dimension that we must not forget. We have this horizontal dimension that we must not forget. But we're trying hard to improve our worship. When we first came, okay, and I don't mean to say anything bad about anybody, but the team was very raw. It was just people taken from here and there all over the place, and they had not played together for any measure of time. Me, as, as a worship leader and as a mu musician, I know that you need time for a team to sort of gel and get good. When we got here, the team was not good. I'm sorry <laughs> for whoever was part of that team. The team was not good. And it wasn't for a long, long time. But let me tell you, every time we worshiped, hands were up like this. Hearts were like this. Smiles on people's faces, radiating with the glory of God and the love of God. That is worship. That, my friends, is worship. So we're doing everything that we can not to distract the non-believer. We're doing everything that we can so that we're not distracting the person who hasn't come to church for a long time and had to go through like his own or her own bad worship in the youth group or something like that. We want to make it so that you will not be embarrassed to invite someone to come to church with you. So, first point of application for you. If you have any feedback about the worship, let me know. Let me know so that we can improve. Okay? Especially if that feedback concerns myself. Let me know. Come talk to me about it. I'm not going to say that I won't be hurt. <laughs> I might be hurt a little bit, but that's just human nature, right? But I'll get over it. I'll get over it. And besides, saving lives, saving lives, and bringing people back into the community of faith is way, way more important than my bruised ego. Hello? So let us know. Now, granted... A lot of times, when we get feedback, it can be very sort of like a, uh, subjective. It, ha it can have to do with personal taste. And I have to be discerning about those, those things, right? But if I get enough feedback on a particular point, then I'm going to listen. And I'm going to do my very best to do something about it, right? There's a bigger picture here that we're shooting for, okay? And by the way, it's okay to give positive feedback too. It's okay. You can give encouraging words. That's good stuff. And I promise I won't get too bloated, okay? CJ will make sure that I don't get too <laughs> puffed up, right? She's good at that. <laughs> so bottom line, 
if you ever have an opportunity to invite a friend to church, our hope and our goal is that you will never feel like you have to make excuses for us. Whether on the way to church or whether after the service. <laughs> okay? And that's my promise on behalf of the worship servants here at GCC, okay? But I, like I said, I would also propose that everyone here contributes to the excellence and the quality of the worship, whether for good or for bad. So the second application for us is this. This one's easy, okay? This one is really, really easy. Just get to service on time. Please. Please. If there was a very important and well-known speaker that was going to be here, I'm pretty sure that you would do everything possible to get here on time and get a good seat. But worship, our audience is always the Lord, the most important person in all the universe. Please get to worship on time. And not only get to worship on time, give yourself a minute, a minute to prepare your heart to worship. I believe that this one simple thing will do immeasurably wonderful things to improve the worship of this community. I really do. So please do that. Finally, to make our worship here at GCC excellent, and here it comes. You are like, whoo. Invest in the community. Invest in the community. Like I said, we're starting the small groups. New, new round of small groups. New season of small groups. Get plugged into a small group. Because that's a wonderful way to get invested into the community. And the reason that I say that is because it's about a heart. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about financial matters here. Although it could include that. I'm talking about your heart. And what Jesus said was just so profoundly deeply powerful. He said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be as well. And I'm not talking about your financial treasures, your monetary treasures. I'm talking about your heart for this community, GCC. Invest your heart in GCC, brothers and sisters. And I guarantee you, the worship here will become excellent overnight. I guarantee it. I really do. So when God brought me to this church, I made a commitment to love this church, which is, which is you all. The people here, um, under grace remnant, also the people in the KM, whatever, whoever is a part of this family here in GCC. I made that commitment because God brought me here. And I believe that God brought every one of you here as well. So I pray that you will take that to heart. Take it to heart and love this family. Make it your spiritual home. Make it your spiritual family. So I want to close with just this one thing. I was reading this one article by a pastor who was talking about the relationship between excellent worship and loving the church and evangelism. And he said this thing. If unbelievers are going to join us on a Sunday morning, and I would include the unchurched as well, people who have been to church and have strayed away. If unbelievers are going to join us on a Sunday, it isn't because they heard that our band is awesome or that I am relatable. It's because their friend loves their church and couldn't wait for the opportunity to invite them. Let's come to the Lord in prayer.